It's an honor tonight to continue the conversation begun in the amazing film, Aggie. And I was able to be in conversation with Aggie in the film and after being in conversation with her for so many years prior. And now I'm here tonight furthering this tradition once again. I hope you've already dipped into the Oasis of Aggie, a film that's offered one of the brightest looks at the future of justice as informed by artists and the creativity that our world desperately needs. The film itself is a feast of art and the healing, inspiration, beauty, and vision that artists share with the world. And for many, it's provided an entry point for people to start learning about the criminal justice system and the need for reform. If you've already seen the film, you know what I'm talking about. It shows how one person can take action to bring about justice. Aggie does this because she sees through art. What a difference that has made. In this film, the art washes over you. It's a love letter to the artists. It's a love letter to the movement for racial justice. And it's a love letter from a daughter to her mother. If there ever were one thing for art to aspire towards, it's what this film captures. If you've not seen the film, don't worry, we won't provide any spoilers, but we can all find ourselves in this story and on this canvas. Now I'd like to introduce you to the incredible individuals who are joining us for this conversation about the film Aggie, Art and Justice. Their longer bios will be put into the chat links where you can find more about their work. But first, I'd like to introduce Catherine Gunn, director of Aggie and founder and director of Auburn Pictures. Catherine is an Emmy-nominated producer, director, writer, and activist. Darren Walker is the president of the Ford Foundation and a visionary philanthropist and change maker. He is the author of From Generosity to Justice. And if you've seen the film already, you know how closely Darren and Aggie have worked to harness the power of art and philanthropy to fight for criminal justice reform and change in our world. Adnan Khan is the co-founder and executive director of Restore Justice, a nonprofit organization he founded while incarcerated at San Quentin. And of course, Agnes Gunn. Aggie is the present emerita of the Museum of Modern Art and chair of its International Council. In June 2017, she launched the Art for Justice Fund in partnership with the Ford Foundation and Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. She is the subject of the film we are talking about tonight. So to begin, Kat, you know, this film, as I just said, is a love letter from a daughter to a mother. But we all know, and those of us who've seen the film, know that you had a reluctant subject, reluctant to be the center of attention, reluctant to give credit to the work that she has done. So can you tell us how and why you made this film about Aggie? Yes, and first I wanna thank you, Thelma Golden, so much for, for being with us tonight. And I wanna thank everyone who's tuned in um, and especially to recognize members of the Academy who've tuned in tonight. Um, and you know, you know, because we've known each other for years, that this is not a film I thought I would ever make. People said, oh, your mom's great, you should make a movie about her. And I was like, never, that's never, that's not something I'm ever gonna do. But as you saw in the movie, Rue Hockley says, you know, when she sold the Liechtenstein to start the Art for Justice Fund, it was so obvious. And that's how I felt. I was like, this is so obvious, but why is no one else doing this? And I think it was because I saw the alchemy of turning this intention behind that sale to, to, to invest in the imagination to end mass incarceration, that there was a, a, a purpose to the sale that was not transactional, that was not about increasing the amount of money. Um, and that, you know, in making the film, I realized I, I had to go back and sort of figure out what had taken her to that place. And I got to look at the studio in a school that she started 40 years ago. And I didn't make a film about studio in a school, but in the movie you hear from Giancarlo, one of the students from studio in a school, and he says, you know, art class, the art classroom was the only place I was ever asked what I thought. The rest of the time I was asked for answers. I either had the answer, it was the right answer, Answer or the wrong answer or I didn't have an answer and he said in art class I was given a voice and I feel like to me suddenly I saw a straight line from studio in a school 
to Art for Justice in terms of the way that Aggie's looking at people who are being denied a voice, be, being denied participation, and able to say, I want to bring people out into the light, not only to include, but to celebrate, to follow, to fund, um, and, and, and to recognize and to have be a part of the conversation that we're having. So it's really about expanding. And actually, it was one of my children, when he saw the first cut of the film, when he saw the film for the first time, it moved me because he said, when Kofi said, um, you know, it, this film makes me realize that if we had had student in school, if all children had had access to problem solving, to learning critical thinking, to learning self-expression, we would never have needed art for justice. And, and that was why I made the movie. I just thought, yes, it's obvious, but no one's doing it. And we need people to access the power of art to make these bigger changes for justice. Thank you. Darren, the fundamental belief that justice hinges on creativity, on imagination, is a new concept for many people. Can you talk about how those are the ways art provides collective imagination? And how does this collective imagination bring about justice? Well, thank you, Thelma, and I'm so grateful to be here to both celebrate this extraordinary film and to celebrate an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary warrior for justice, Agnes Gunn. Creativity is rooted in the capacity for empathy, the capacity for compassion. To have a more just world, we need to be a more empathetic and compassionate society. And one of the things that Aggie knew from many, many years ago, before there was research on the brain that proved this, before there was a field of neuroscience, that validated the idea that from exposure to the arts, one gains a greater sense of empathy, compassion, and the ability to see the dignity in all people, which is ultimately how we get to a more just society. So when you can see the dignity in other human beings, it allows you to put yourself in their shoes. It allows you to walk in their footsteps and understand the challenges that they may face. And one of the things that Aggie brings to this enterprise of philanthropy is an understanding of the difference between charity and generosity, which is what philanthropy is often rooted in and discussed through that lens of charity, of giving back. Aggie actually moves from charity and generosity to justice and dignity. And as, as a philanthropist, that is a bold move and there is a big gap from moving from those two things of generosity and uh, charity to justice and dignity. Thank you, Darren. It's so wonderful you say that because um, when asked to speak about your book, uh, what Aggie said is that you illustrate how philanthropy is about more than giving money away. It's about giving energy and providing righteous optimism for the sake of justice. So with that, Aggie, I'd like now to move to you because really this film is about, of course, this one amazing act that you did, right? Selling this beloved painting to create the Art for Justice Fund. But that act was really one that's connected to your whole life of engagement with art. So you're known so much for your generosity, for your grace, and for your empathy that you feel for other people. And that really comes through in your relationship to artists. 
Can you talk about the role that artists have played in your life and what you have learned from them? Well, thank you, Delma. I've learned an awful lot from artists and, and not maybe by explaining it to them too much, but by um, just living in the world that is about art. And um, I, I, for instance, I see Georgia O'Keeffe in clouds all the time. There are things that remind me of Georgia O'Keeffe, or I see um, I, there are days when the um, sunset or sunrise um, makes you see a Rothko and in its different colors and the way it goes up from having a horizon which isn't the regular horizon but um, is is a one that you think of. I also lo love um, Glenn Ligon's um, uh, pieces that are very um, dark, some of them, and then other ones where he scribbles on them and makes um, them be uh, not there or seemingly obliterated, but they're, you know, they're, they're one person's interpretation of what childhood scribbles look like, except that they're not that. They're another thing altogether than that. And um, it's just that you see so much, like for instance, your background is something that um, has a lot of um, uh, things going on in it and you can see um, what you want to see almost. You, you can make faces and make people and make buildings and out of what you see or not, whatever you feel it goes w with what you um, perceive. So I, I just love um, the fact that um, you, when you, especially in a time like this, when um, there's an epidemic out there and you're somewhat isolated, you can make um, up things that, you know, get you through it, at least get me through it. And um, so I'm very thankful to Catherine for the film and to you and to Darren and to uh, Anand. But I, I really think all, all of you have such a big part to play in this whole um, thing of social justice. And um, Darren has, has really helped me a lot and Catherine and Sonia in bringing us to be able to participate in this in such a big way and yet um, doing all the work that's necessary and Helena is doing all the work on um, you know making this happen so it it really is um, multiple people that have put it together so that's what I'm Can I say about. one thing though? Because I do love that Aggie's as always talks to me about and has shown me that it's her relationship to artists that is more important even than her relationship to a piece of art, that it's knowing artists and that's why she collects contemporary art. But when she does talk about art like that, it's just like, it's so moving to me. I feel like, you know, Georgia O'Keeffe gave Aggie a relationship to the sky. Like there's a way that this, work stays with her and affects how she spends every day, how she goes outside, how she flies in an airplane, how she looks up and on any airplanes. Not anymore. on any airplanes. <laughs> but um have you been able to travel at all, Darren? <laughs> Darren has No, Aggie, I'm not traveling. But what I am doing and what I want to focus on is how we continue to advance what you have birthed in this world. Aggie, you remember when you and I, you first had this idea, what, what upset you so much, because we know that you and your good friend, Cindy Sherman, went to see Ava's film and 
what upset you so much was the inhumanity of what you saw and what you wanted to bring attention to was the need for more love in the world, the need for more compassion, the need for more grace, the need for more healing. And what is amazing was, I think in the middle of this pandemic, what you were calling out for in society is needed even more than when you first made that commitment and the message that you sent out to the world, that this wasn't about just a painting, but it was about the condition of the way we treat each other and the way issues of racism especially are treated in our society. And I, I did think that was the most important thing about what made me want to do this was um, the injustice that was dealt to the people that really um, may have committed a crime or some kind of infringement on something in society, but they weren't being treated as human beings. They were being treated as um, people that didn't have a, you had no respect for and you, you immediately disliked and you would continue to dislike. And what made me realize that these, these people are just, you know, they're really in, in a way, most of them are able to be in the society and really do something like, uh, and uh, has done so much that is, so important and he even has a baby now <laughs> and everything so that i you know it's it's um it's what can be done with people's lives that aren't right. subjected to aren't stepped on and and put down and you know always put in the wrong um shoes so that's what i think is is so important about what's happened with this money. Thank you for that, Aggie. Well, Adnan, it's clear you've had a huge impact on Aggie and you are a visionary in the work to change the narrative that drives uh, mass incarceration and leadership in the arts for justice community. Can you tell our audience how you and Aggie got connected? Yeah, um, well, it's, you know, honestly, building right off of what Darren and, and Aggie are, are, are talking about here, um, there's, there's a part in, this, uh, in, the, in the documentary, in the film, where Darren and Aggie are having a conversation, and it's about uh, mass incarceration and um, uh, incarcerated people. And Darren, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this. Um, there's a part where you ask Aggie in the, in the film, hey, um, what do you think about people who say you do the time, do the crime, or that you deserve prison? And then, like, immediately, impulsively, uh, uh, without thought, Aggie just says, have they ever been to a prison? Have they ever met anyone inside? And so the scene cuts to San Quentin. And that's literally where we all met. Myself, me, Catherine, Darren, Helena, who, who's not here right now, we're, all came into a prison. Not for, I want to specify, not for a prison tour. Right? We're not anim zoo animals where people come in, where a lot of people do actually come in to do a tour of prisons that is very, uh, very further dehumanizing. They came to visit us. Um, and, and what really stuck out for me in that moment was that you, they didn't care. They never asked what we did. Hey, what'd you guys do to get to prison? What, what was it that you did while you were here? Th that didn't matter. Um, only thing that mattered was who we were. What are we doing? Show, show us your art. Talk about, you know, philosophy, psychology, um, you know, your paintings for those who were in the art room. Um, it, it was just a conversation between human beings. And yes, we were inside of a prison facility. I was serving a life sentence. I was sentenced to 25 to life at the age of 18. And that was maybe in my 14th year. Um, so in that moment, I'm still you know, in my head. I'm dying. I'm going to die in prison. I had made, quote unquote, peace with that. And I, I, the level of generosity, um, sure, sure there was, there's funding behind it, there's philanthropy, but what Darren was saying, like the generosity came from us honestly just having a human conversation. 
And, you know, I want to emphasize that. And sadly, that was very important to me when it shouldn't be, when prisons should not be, uh, or, you know, when we incarcerate people, when we hold people accountable or try to hold them accountable, to just be treated and have a regular conversation, um, there's a thirst for that. And it's very sad to say that. I just want to si say that on the side. But that, but having that meeting, having that conversation, learning more about, um, you know, about me, them learning about me, me learning about them was very, very profound. Now, I'm going to close off just this part with this. I know we're going to the Q&A. What I want to say is that miraculously, a, a, a law changed in California. And about two years after that, I'm out. I'm free. And so two years prior is when I met Darren, Aggie, Catherine, Helena, and all of them. As soon as I got out, I don't even know how they got my email, but I get the email. Like, hey, we'd love to fly you out to New York. Come on over. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's an email from Catherine. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Want to wanna, wanna throw you a welcome home party. And I'm in California. I'm in Los Angeles right now. So I'm not going to refuse a flight to New York. I, I went to New York for the first time some of my life it was amazing but what was more amazing was I sat in this in the home now I just got out of prison 30 days 40 days maybe maybe a little longer than that and, and just got uh, vacated from a life sentence after doing 16 years and the the you know the level of humanity of let me come to you know I'm inviting you into my home where I sleep right they didn't see the danger the crime the safety you know the I'm so scared of this person coming into a very personal space of mine didn't matter. I was treated like a human being because they, they see uh, incarcerated people or people who are marginalized as human beings. So here I am eating uh, homemade Sundays in, in, in Catherine's home and just uh, talking with people and meeting her family. And just, it was amazing, you know? And then after that, uh, they offered me um, to be a recipient of the, the foundation. And that's when my, my leadership has been uh, continued. So it was more of that personal relationship. It was a friendship, not funder giving to an activist, right? It was friends who are in the same mission, same vision, who are helping each other in their own mission and vision. Um, and that's how, when, when, when Aggie and Darren and Catherine talk about philanthropy, um, that's how I believe it should be. But I would also say, Adnan, when, of course, you were so amazing when um, we met you at San Quentin, but the law that you refer to is a camp, was a campaign that Agnes invested in and other philanthropists invested in to have the law changed so that the governor could give clemency, could do early parole, et cetera. And so it was through that advocacy and many, many people have been inspired to engage. And now the Art for Justice Fund is one of the leading funders of campaigns like the California campaign in other states, including Aggie's home state of Ohio. So advocacy and policy change is a major part of what Aggie is investing in through the Art for Justice Fund, which results in the impact of having people uh, be released and be able to then return to their communities and to a productive life. And Darren, could I just ask you to talk a little bit more though about Art for Justice so our audience can understand the advocacy, of course, being an important part of it. But can you talk about this very innovative philanthropic structure? Of course, I think what Aggie said when she made the decision to sell the great painting, that amazing uh, Lichtenstein masterpiece, as it, uh, he called it and named it. Um, first, it was important to understand that for Aggie, this was a deeply personal decision because she and Roy Lichtenstein had a very special relationship. And Roy's widow, Dorothy, is one of Aggie's closest friends. But it was Dorothy who encouraged Aggie to follow her instinct to sell the painting and then to use the proceeds, in this case, $100 million of the proceeds, and start a fund that would have as, as its purpose to invest in artists, to invest in advocacy and policy that would result 
in a reduction in the number of people incarcerated because what Aggie wanted to impact as a philanthropist is what she saw in Ava's film, which was data that demonstrated that the United States is the most over-incarcerated nation in the world. And so what Aggie wanted to do was to reduce the number of people in prison and county jails. And so what she has invested in through the fund is efforts to uh, eliminate cash bail, to eliminate mandatory minimums, uh, to have prosecutorial reform so that we have prosecutors who understand the dynamics uh, and don't just say lock them up. Um, and so all of this came out of her aspiration to reduce that number. The other thing that Aggie did was to inspire numerous, countless philanthropists to both give art, to give money to match her gifts, and to do all sorts of generous things. I mean, I'll tell you one funny story um, that happened because Aggie has a dear friend who called and said, you know, I wanna help. I'm so inspired by you, Aggie, but my husband doesn't wanna sell any of the art. And, and she said, but I have an idea. He gave me, he's given me so much jewelry. I've got a few things. I think I'm gonna sell something really quite fabulous. She sold a little brooch. $500,000 later, that brooch brought the proceeds, which have been turned into support for the kinds of things that Aggies wanted to achieve. And she's, we've seen countless people do that. And so it's pretty remarkable when you think about the, the amplification of this idea and the kind of a domino effect that Aggie is having across all of philanthropy, and particularly in arts philanthropy. Thank you. Before we move to questions from our audience, um, I want to ask um, both Aggie and Kat a variation on a question that I started with. And so, Aggie, I want to ask you why you allowed Kat to make this film about you. Well, it was sort of, we drifted into this place. Um, she, she um, I, you know, it brought other people in and especially her kids who she brought in, who now have changed very much from the guy on the um, pens and on the bed who said, I want to learn about life, you know, or something when he was answering a question for me which um, uh, she began to see really did make a movie about things that weren't necessarily um, uh, about me, but about generally life and so <laughs> I think it was, you know, it's, um, it's a great question because she's notoriously camera shy. And obviously I, I addressed that in the film that she's, shunning the, the camera. Um, but to me, it really became a kind of fundamental uh, issue of trust. Because when I finally asked her, which was only after the movie was made, because I didn't want to ask her while we were making it, I was afraid she'd say, oh, we're making a movie, let's not. So I didn't. Um, and I, and so I, when I did ask her, she said, I said, why did you actually do it? And she said, because you asked me to. And I think that that goes to, you know, this sort of deep relationship, but also to the question of protection and safety that I think is at the core of the, the social justice work, but also the artistic visions that we do want to protect people that we love. And, you know, when people look at my kids and one of my sister's kids and say, Aggie's got a multiracial family and she has black grandchildren and, you know, how did that affect her decision to make the movie. I think there was a part of her that felt like she was in love with people she felt were vulnerable. And it reminded me, which is part of why I unspooled, you know, the beauty of getting to make a movie is that we don't have to use the statistics and say, oh, there's 
2.2 million people behind bars. There's four, over 4 million people under supervision of parole and probation. Instead, we can tell the stories and make you feel what's going on, which is what artists do, you know, as my Angelou always says, right? That it's not what people say or what they do, it's how they make you feel. And, and so by using the film, it allowed me to realize, okay, so it's the kids that have changed our family, but also I changed her family. When I came out, she said to me, I always knew that. And my first reaction was, why didn't you tell me? Because you could have saved me all this time and trouble. Um, and she said, because I was hoping for the best, which as you can see, at, I was like, I was mad because I thought that's not, this is the best, there's nothing wrong. And then I realized that what she was, that's what she's saying with Art for Justice too. She's hedging the bet to make the world more fair and more safe and, and, and to protect people she loves, which is everybody to sort of increase the community that receives protection and that, and that, and that gets looked out for. Um, so I think, I think she understood that I was going to take this story a little bit further and that's why you did it, right? But there's, <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, with, I think there is an element of trust that is like, but you, you know how to make a movie like this. I didn't, I wouldn't have, been able to make that movie so um that's what you know that i don't know <laughs> yeah so we work together that's right but i think that the gift of it um for those of us of course who've had the privilege of knowing aggie as a friend and a philanthropist and a supporter and an ally and an advocate is that you also tell you know her, your full story aggie we get to understand the sort of fullness of your life you know, the way in which you have existed in the world. And I think that's a gift as well, because it also gives us a sense of, you know, where this deep feeling, right, your deep humanity comes from. And then we see it, of course, in your family, right, through Kat's eyes as the artist who made this film, but also through your grandchildren. So it's, it's a real gift. And I think we all feel privileged right, to have had the experience. Now I'm going to move to questions. So first is a question for, um, for you, Anand. Did art play a role during your incarceration? And what pro programs, if any, did you participate in that bring art and, uh, art and justice full circle? So the question is, what programs did you participate in that bring art and justice full circle? But I hope you'll answer that question, but also tell us a bit about Restore Justice. Yeah, thank you. So. Um... My first experience with quote unquote art was my first five minutes um, in a cell ever. Um, when I was arrested, I was arrested two o'clock in the morning, taken through the whole process of policing, forensics, um, all throughout the night uh, until the AM when I was finally transferred to the county jail. Um, hadn't eaten, hadn't slept. And then that's when the, the deputy sheriff put me in the cell and slammed the door behind me. And in that moment, that's when panic started to strike. I've never, like I said, been in a jail cell before like that. And um, so I tried to like pace, I was pacing back and forth in this cell. And uh, real quick, I also wanna add that, uh, which I learned later, anytime a person is removed from a cell, a quick, small, short cleaning crew would come in and they would you know, empty the cell. Like that's part of the cleaning. Yes, they would quickly mop and maybe disinfect some stuff, but they would empty the cell of any sheets, any books, any, any anything. So when I get in the cell, by the way, before I got in the cell, they hand me my roll of linen, which is basically a, a sheet, um, a wool blanket, um, a pillowcase without a pillow, and uh, maybe another set of, uh, a towel. And then with that, what they gave us, what gave us what they call a fish kit. A fish kit is a small little tiny, maybe Ziploc bag. It has a small bar of soap that the, the county produces, a small razor, a small comb, um, and then a small, a golf pencil, no stamps, no envelopes, no papers, just a golf pencil. And I remember initially, even in that space, when I handed it to me, it didn't make sense. Why do I have a golf pencil? So in the cell, panic striking in, I'm having a panic anxiety attacks and the cell is empty, but there's a small, there's a, there's a table or a desk in there that has a little pocket in the middle. And I just happened to look in the pocket and I put my hand in there and there was a book and I pulled the book out and it was a, a textbook, it was a social studies textbook. And, in, and I'm flipping through the pages. I have no interest in learning about social studies in this moment, but I'm trying to distract myself. 
flipping through the pages and at the end of it, there were two blank pages in the book, um, except for a stamp that said the, the county property, county education property, and they were, but they were blank. They were almost like thick in construction paper. And uh, impulsively, I, I ripped out those two pieces of paper, um, went to the golf pencil, and I sat there and I just started writing. I, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was writing about. I just wrote. I wrote my pain, my shame, my trauma, my anger. I was cussing people out, maybe. I was, I was seeking for forgiveness, I, all sorts of things. I just, and I just kept writing. And the golf pants, I, I write with a heavy hand, and particularly that day, I was writing with a heavier hand. And they don't have pencil sharpeners in the cell. So I remember I was like picking at it with my, with my fingernails, trying to sharpen the pencil, just so I could quickly get back to my writing. Um, so I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, and by the end of it, I completed both pages, front and back, and I put the pencil down, and I, I just, I fell asleep. You know, I fell asleep, and I fell asleep, not, you know, obviously not happily, but a sense of relief that I needed just in that moment to, to find my, uh, that comfort. So anyways, I, it was just, um, that was my first encounter with art, per se, in prison, in jail, by the way. Um, I pursued my writing after that. Um, I try, I'm not a good artist. I don't draw. I can barely make stick figures. Um, so so that, what, that became my art for a long time, um, was writing. But fast forward several years uh, later, about almost like maybe four, 12 to 13 years later, I was fortunate to co-found an organization called Restore Justice. And what we do is we work on um, life sentences and extreme sentences, and particularly those sentenced to life. Um, and try to, you know, revision a new society, a new way of responding to harm. So that's what we, I co-founded while I was incarcerated. But together with that, what I co-founded was this media filmmaking project called First Watch. So First Watch is basically, imagine, and I don't know how I did it, but somehow convinced the administration to let donations, um, let, let people donate from the outside, inside the prison, brand new camera equipment, new computers where we could edit uh, videos on, lighting equipment, you know, tripods, mics, just a small little film kit where um, incarcerated people, currently incarcerated people, imagine walking around a prison, obviously supervised, but walking around a prison with a, a boom mic, um, you know, a little light reflector and filming our own narrative. And I think that the parallel that with Aggie, the, the, doc, the movie Aggie that stands out to me is that the movie was done by, by someone um, very proximate to Aggie, right? And not just proximate to Aggie, but proximate to the movement. Um, you know, in, in the documentary there, they go through, it takes you through different marginalized people's movements for the last four, several decades, right? And then leads up to mass incarceration and so on. And so with the, with the filmmaking inside, similarly it was impacted people, currently incarcerated people making videos and kind of reclaiming our own media narrative because it has been media that has told the story about who we are forever. Um, you know, through newspapers, through uh, radio, through uh, video. So it was an opportunity for us to reclaim our own narrative, share the story that we want to share by making the movies and the films that we want to create ourselves as currently incarcerated people. Uh, so that became my art. And I just fell in love with film and, and um, making, you know, picking up a camera, storyboarding, because uh, I love to write um, all of that. So that's part of the project as well. Thank you. Kat, um, could you talk about how you build a character on screen? I mean, the character, of course, is Aggie, but how did this uh, building happen in tandem with discovery? You know, your discovery of Aggie through all the different people she was in conversation with. What, what revelations came from this for you? It was really, you know, as I said, I started making it. The reason I thought the film would be worthwhile would, was because of this of Art for Justice. So that was where I started, and I and it's not a biopic or like a chronological film, um, but what I wanted to do was figure out what elements. And you started talking about this earlier, but what elements we needed to know to make sense of each decision that was made, and those were the parts that I sort of unspooled and that I foregrounded, and you know her certain experiences. But to me, it really was based in a question that we all have, um, which is how did we come to hold the deeply held beliefs that we have? And as we know now, you know, more than ever, 
half the country shares some beliefs and the other half of the country shares the opposite beliefs. And, and, and where are we not just to necessarily find a middle ground, but how can we use culture and storytelling as Adnan was talking about? And, and how can we access an emotional place where we actually can start changing the story and, and, and understanding how someone, my siblings, Aggies, I mean, people grow up in the same household with the same parents and they have very different beliefs. How do we become those people? And how does our accessing that evolution and growth allow us to then find a commonality with people who are different than us? I think that was the trajectory of how I, and my amazing editor, Gil Seltzer, um, who I worked with because like, unlike some documentary films that have they find their narrative because there's a story that um, uh, reveals itself um, and, and so they can follow that. We were using art to kind of tell the story and not using as much archival footage or archival photographs but instead going into these what we called internally art stories where you just see, I mean all of the art in the film has been in Aggie's collection in one way or another um, and, and I think you start to get a sense of what that mean I mean here we are and this is in the film um, so it was it was a developing the character she revealed herself to us through the artwork but I think it was also that you know I did start by not making a movie and asking her if I could just do some interviews because I wanted some archives and she said yes which was wonderful and then we sat down had a conversation it was terrible it was so boring and sort of not good. And that was when I said, let me just film you with the kids. And as you, Darren and Thelma, were both in conversation, I did not ask you what to say, to, much to some people's chagrin. Some people wrote story, wrote, wrote questions out. All of my kids wrote questions and I didn't script them at all. And so it had two benefits. One was I could never have come up with questions like what John Waters asked her. I just wouldn't have been known to do that so thankfully i didn't script people but the other thing is that it actually i think made it, uh, the film feel more like a verite film because it's not a q a um it's actually a shared moment between her and these different prisms parts of herself that reveal you know there's philanthropy and artists and friends and family and all these different parts of her that get revealed in the conversations Thank you. Darren, uh, there's a question that uh, asks, what advice would you give organizations who have a fraction of your, and I believe that means Art for Justice and or Ford Foundation budget, to motivate them to collaborate versus compete with other similar service providers? How can you convince them of the win-win of not only the people serve for the organization? What advice would you have? I mean, my advice is one, we donors should encourage collaboration. And so that's the first thing is we sometimes make uh, organizations feel as though they are pitted against each other in the same sort of space, let's just say of uh, criminal justice reform. I think we should encourage it and we should fund in ways that encourage it. Um, I think that actually collaboration and demonstrating collaboration makes um, a group of nonprofits a more attractive investment proposition. So I think actually um, by working together and going together to donors, uh, nonprofits are better positioned to actually raise more money. Thank you. Um, and there's a somewhat of a follow up to that, which is that um, there's a question that says there's an understanding that this fund uh, sunsets and how is there a plan that you and Aggie have about how others might continue the reach of this philanthropy. Well, the, I, the good news is that the fund is going to um, Aggie's decided to extend the fund for an additional year. Um, secondly, there have already been other philanthropists who are taking up uh, the gauntlet, uh, not necessarily at the scale and volume uh, of Aggie's commitment, but 
The point here is that she has spawned a movement among philanthropy, in philanthropy. If you look at the recent grants made by Mackenzie Scott Bezos, many of those grantees were Art for Justice grantees that Mackenzie Scott did not know of, but through her own research or the research of the professionals she hired to help her, they were brought to many of those same grantees because she too is interested in ending mass incarceration. So the point here is that, is not that Aggie needs to um, sell another painting and raise another $100 million, it's that actually she's built a movement that is transforming philanthropy and arts philanthropy and forging a new domain of philanthropy that brings the intersection of two uh, areas that never before Aggie intersected, and that is arts philanthropy and social justice philanthropy. And so I actually am less um, worried that this is not going to continue or that the resources are going to fall off a cliff and there won't be. There are a lot of philanthropists who may not be calling it art for justice too, but they are actually doing what Aggie hopes he could do, which is to spawn a movement. Thank you. Aggie, you spoke a bit about this before, but I want to ask anyone on this panel, because you know so much of what is at the center of this film is your love for art, Aggie, and that's where you're an inspiration. So it, does anyone want to contribute here about how art has been important to them during this pandemic moment? Well, the one thing I can say is look at, um, I, you know, studio in the school, they've done more in this time than uh, anyone could be, both um, Tom and Allison, who runs the studio in the school program, have been putting our art out in um, volumes and, and that it really helps. It's, it's a way to um, make children center on um, what art can do for them and what they can get out of making art. Mm -hmm. So I think that also that artists are going to be the key to the, the process of healing and, and growth and recovery that we have to look forward to in the next, in the progressive decade in front of us. And that artists are, need to be treated as workers, need to be acknowledged as, you know, in the same way that other laborers in our society are so that we can actually have the advantage of, of the vision and the solutions and the problem solving skills that artists bring to it. But artists have really suffered because they aren't in full-time jobs, they don't have health insurance, they're, you know, the, the Broadway's closed, all the stages are closed, the dancing, the theater, you know, I mean, we could go on about how arts, what it needs to recover now, but I think that our new administration and, and the movement that's been going that is so infused with art really need to be followed um, because I think they do have the answers. And I think that there is a power in the culture and the narrative shift that, that maybe hasn't been reflected in the, in the political power and the sort of traditional, you know, the white male power that's being challenged. But, but the cultural power we have is big and we need to, to use it to our advantage. Any I, I yeah, know. I mean, I think for me, for me, it would it would be um, not necessarily a, a direct um, art form like painting or even filmmaking because of the pandemic, but what what the being a recipient of art for justice and philanthropy, what has allowed me and a lot of my uh, colleagues and other uh, uh, people in the community and organizers is to organize specifically around this time of COVID in prisons. We have seen um, devastating, devastating. Um, and, and tragedies have taking place actively right now. There, there's, a, there's a couple of prisons that have 800 cases that people are sick right now in their beds, um, you know, inadequate healthcare, um, you know, dying 90 people in state of California prisons 
90 people have died in nine months. That's an average of 10 people dying of COVID a month in California prisons, you know, um, and exponentially grow that number on a national scale, right? Um, we have, we have 2.3 million people incarcerated, you know, we have um, thousands and thousands of jails and prisons. It's, it's, it's really, in times of COVID especially, um, it's been terrible. So what we, we've been able to do is sustain not just the organization, the structure of the organization, but sustain the advocacy and that effort up um, much more louder. Um, and we've seen some results here in California, our efforts in California, where the governor, um, you know, we did press conferences with legislators in front of the prison of San Quentin was one of them, where um, state senators and assembly members, we've called on them, come to the prison list and call on media and, and uh, elected of other elected officials, district attorneys, we're all at this press conference and, and urging the governor and the prisons to, to do something. And the next day they announced, the governor announced the release of 8,000 incarcerated people. Though that I'm happy, I was happy and am happy for those 8,000, that's nowhere near enough a COVID response. So the work continues. Um, but what I am grateful for is that I was, I'm able to do that work because of Art for Justice and philanthropy um, especially, especially in a time like this right now with COVID in prisons and jails. I hope that, um, it, you know, you will be able to get more people out of prison now because I think they just need the care and the use of, um, maybe they'll be able to get the vaccine if they're out of prison, whereas in prison, I don't know what they're going to do about the vaccine because I think it's going to come very late so. to them, yeah. and um, which would be, it is such a shame because if we could just give it across the board, that would be better than the way we're going to distribute it. But anyway, that I don't want to get into that discussion. <laughs> Well, what I'd love now, Kat, is for you to talk about, because, you know, this film in many ways is about a movement, right? The movement created by Aggie's gesture, but it's also created a movement. So can you talk about the impact um, efforts? And also, can you talk about where we can see Aggie? Yeah. Um, well, we do have, we, we are continuing the work. We have a syllabus that has been developed by a wonderful professor at Georgetown University named Andrea, Andrea Hueso. And the syllabus is an art and justice and it uses the film as a jumping off point. Um, we have a discussion guide that you can find on our website, aggiefilm.com. Um, that was developed by my team at Aubin during COVID, which extends all of the themes of women's leadership and philanthropy and criminal justice reform and arts education. It develops those things. Um, and then we have a game, this amazing card game, which I don't have here at Aggies, but it's called Words of Art. And you don't have to know anything about art. And it has 150 pieces from Aggies collection. You play like apples to apples, where you just say what you feel or think when you look at it and, and you can learn. Um, and I know Christina is going to put some information about words of art. It was, um, is being published by Penguin Random House and it will come out on April 13th and you can pre-order it everywhere now. Um, and the film is available on iTunes, Google, Vudu and Amazon and um, also on the Academy screening platform for Academy members. Um, and we, you know, we, we are developing more and more impact. We're working now um, on making the film available inside prisons. Um, we're looking to work with people in financial institutions that Darren can talk about that, that, that do collect art, that do want to figure out how to jump into this river, that do want to make change and participate. Um, so we're really trying to now that as everyone in the film world knows, it's been such a weird year to release a film. We opened at, at Sundance, which was so much fun, and then all of a sudden we went online. Um, but we have been able to have these kinds of conversations, which have been wonderful with artists and activists, and, um, and, and a lot of those are on our website too. And now we're starting to organize the, um, the rollout the more proactive rollout with, within the prisons and in the universities. So I think that that's how you can do it. But thank you everybody for watching tonight. And thank you all for being here and for sharing your, your visions and your wisdom and your beautiful smiles with us.
Well, thank you. I think, you know, Darren, Adnan, I know we all feel privileged to be in conversation with you, to be your colleagues, and to have had this moment. But really, I know we all thank you, Aggie, for everything you are and the inspiration that you have provided so many. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good evening.